Hi, listeners. For potential AI founders, my early stage AI fund, Conviction, is accepting applications for its Embed Accelerator for two more days. Embed offers $150,000 in an uncapped safe, more than half a million of free compute and API credits, a hand-selected set of peers, and access to leading founder and research mentors. Apply at embed.conviction.com by March 1st. Hi, listeners, and welcome to another episode of No Priors. Today, we're excited to be talking to the CTO of AMD, Mark Papermaster. Mark has had a storied career in chips and hardware with previous leadership positions at IBM, Apple, and Cisco. We're excited to have Mark on to get into GPUs and the competition that's been driving this industry. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, sir. Glad to be here with you and Elad. Can you start by telling us a bit about your background? You've worked on all sorts of interesting things from the iPhone and the iPad to like the latest generation of AMD supercomputing chips. Oh, sure. I've been around a while. So what's really fun is my timing was pretty good getting into the industry. I was an electrical and computer engineering grad, University of Texas, and got really interested in chip design. And so it was back at a time when chip design was radically changing. The kind of technology everyone uses today, CMOS, was just coming into uh, you know, production usage. And so I got uh, on IBM's very first CMOS projects and created some of the first designs. So I got to get my hands dirty and do just about every facet of uh, chip design and had a number of years at IBM and uh, took on different roles, uh, took on uh, driving the microprocessor development at uh, IBM across uh, first their uh, power uh, PCs, and that was you know meant working with Apple and uh, Motorola, as well as the big iron, the the big computing chips that we had in the mainframe and the in the big RISC servers. So, uh, really got all facets of, of technology there, and included uh, working on some of their uh, server development. But then uh, shifted over to um, uh, to Apple. Uh, Steve uh, Jobs hired me to run the iPhone and uh, iPod, uh, and so I was there for a couple of years. <laughs> But it was a, a time of a great transition in the, opportun- in the uh, industry. And, and for me, it was a great opportunity because I ended up in 2011, fall of 2011, uh, taking the role here at AMD of being both CTO uh, and, and really running the technology and engineering. And right at a point where Moore's Law is starting to slow down. And so, uh, you know, tremendous innovation was needed. Yeah, I want to get into that and sort of what we can expect in terms of computing innovation if we're not just jamming more transistors on chips or we're unable to do that. Um, Every one of our listeners, I think, has heard of AMD, but can you give like a a very brief overview of the major markets you serve there? Sure. So AMD is a a storied company. It's been uh, around well over 50 years, and it, uh, it started out really being you know, a uh, second source company, really bringing, uh, you know, second source on key components and x86 microprocessors. But you fast forward to where we are uh, today, uh, and it's a very, very broad portfolio. Uh, when uh, Lisa and Sue, our CEO, and I were brought uh, into the company just over 10 years ago, uh, it was with a, a mandate to uh, get uh, AMD back into very, very strong competitiveness. And so uh, we started with the CPU line, brought the CPU, uh, very, very competitive, and then really across the portfolio. And just in February of 2022, acquired Xilinx. So that expanded the portfolio further. So AMD creates the world's largest supercomputers. It's got a massive install base now in the cloud. So many of your cloud operations that you're running are running on uh, AMD Epic uh, x86 CPUs. Gaming were, were, were huge. We're underneath all the uh, Xbox, all the PlayStation, as well as uh, many uh, gaming devices that, uh, uh, that, that you buy when you buy your, your uh, add-in boards. And then across uh, embedded devices with all of that rich uh, Xilinx portfolio, as well as embedded x86. And we, we acquired Pensando, so it extends that uh, portfolio uh, right into a networking interconnect that we need as we, as we scale out these workloads. So very, very broad portfolio. Yeah, AMD has had a pretty amazing run over the last decade plus since you joined. Um, one of the things that you folks have really emphasized over the last couple of years, as well as AI, and there's been a big shift both in terms of the adoption of AI over the last decade or so in terms of the traditional uh, CNN, RNN, and other types of um, neural network architectures, but also in terms of this shift to transformers and diffusion models and everything else. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what initially caught your attention in the AI landscape and then how AMD started to focus more and more on that over time and what, what sort of solutions you've come up with? You bet. Well, uh, we all know the AI journey, you know, has been going since uh, really the, uh, the race began when uh, the application space for AI opened up uh, and GPUs were obviously uh, pivotal there. When you look at the uh, the the key work that uh, you know uh, Hinton had done in terms of showing how GPUs could drastically improve the uh, accuracy of image recognition, natural language processing, uh, and so that that that's been known uh, for some time. And so what we did at AMD is uh, we uh, right away uh, saw the opportunity. Uh, the question was plotting our course. Uh, to be that strong player in AI. So it was a very uh, thoughtful and del deliberate strategy because AMD, we had to turn around the company. So if you look at where AMD was uh, in uh, tw you know, 2012, uh, you know, through uh, the, you know, really 2017, uh, it was largely all, all of the revenue was based on PCs and then gaming. And so it, it was about making sure that the portfolio, the building blocks, were competitive. Those building blocks had to be leadership. They had to attract people to uh, get on that AMD uh, platform for high performance applications. And so first we actually had to rebuild the CPU roadmap. And that was the Zen microprocessors that, uh, that we released in uh, 2017 uh, in both uh, PCs with our Ryzen line, as well as Epic, our x86 server line. So that started the revenue ramp for the company and, and started extending uh, our portfolio. And so right about uh, that time, uh, in parallel, as we saw where heterogeneous computing was going, we had, we had called the ball on heterogeneous computing before uh, myself, before Lisa ever joined the company, uh, uh, AMD had made a, a great acquisition of ATI that brought GPU into the portfolio. It's one of the big reasons I was attracted to uh, to AMD uh, in the role is that wow it was one of the it was the really the only company that had uh, a very strong CPU portfolio and a very strong GPU portfolio and to me it was clear that the industry needed that powerful combination of the serial the scalar competing of these traditional CPU workloads and the massive parallelization that you get from a GPU uh, and so we started with that heterogeneous compute uh, and created an architecture around that. So we've been shipping CPUs and GPUs combined for PC applications longer than anyone started shipping those in 2011 with what we call APUs, accelerated processor units. And then for big data applications, we started with HPC, the kind of high performance compute technology that's in national labs, it's in uh, oil exploration companies. And so uh, we uh, focused uh, first with uh, you know big government bids that ended up leading uh, to supercomputer wins that we now have AMD uh, CPU and AMD GPUs under the world's largest supercomputers, but that work started years ago, and it was equally a hardware and a software effort. Uh, and so uh, we've been building that hardware and software capability, and it really culminated in December 6 of 2023 of last year when we announced our flagship, the MI300, which just is a beast for both uh, high-performance compute with one variant we have and takes high-performance uh, AI for both training and inference uh, head-on. Uh, with with a variant which is optimized for those AI applications. So it's been a long journey, and we're really pleased uh, to be where we are, where uh, our, our sales are taking off. No, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I guess when you launched the MI300, um, you had public commitments from Meta and Microsoft, for example, to purchase that. And you just mentioned that there's a series of applications that you're pretty excited about there. Can you tell us more about which AI applications and workloads you're most excited about or mo most bullish on today? Sure. So if you think about where the bulk of AI is today, you're still seeing just tremendous capital expenditures in building up the accuracy of capabilities for large language model training and inference. So it is the, the likes of ChatGPT, of BARD, and, and, you know, and the other uh, you know, LLMs that you can uh, ask it anything because it's trying to ingest 
the vast of data that is that is out there and it can be trained upon and it's it's with really a, an you know an ultimate goal of artificial general intelligence an AGI type of uh, of capability and so uh, that is where we focus the MI three hundred is to start with that that halo product that could take on the industry leader and in fact MI three hundred's done that it's competitive on training and it leads. And inferencing, it has uh, over two uh, x. Uh, if you look at uh, you know FP16 VLLMs, which is a, a, a metric that you know, generally everyone uh, uh, can run that, it's got a tremendous performance advantage. And and we did that very purposely. We created very efficient uh, engines for the, the math processing that you need for that uh, training or inference uh, processing. But we also brought the memory that you need to have more efficient computing. So that's more computing at less power, less rack space uh, than you need with competition. A big front of competition is, as you just pointed out, there's performance, like overall performance, there's efficiency, and then there's uh, like the software platform, like CUDA, Rockem, et cetera. How do you think about the investment in the optimized math libraries and like how you want developers to understand your approach versus competitors? Yeah, you're, you're so right, Sarah. It's multifaceted to be able to compete in this arena. Uh, you see many uh, startups going after the space, but the the fact is the, the bulk of inferencing uh, done today is done on general purpose CPUs, not the huge LLM inferencing, but you know just general uh, inferencing for AI applications. And then for large language model applications, it's almost all on GPUs because that is the software and developer ecosystem that's out there. And so we've been competitive on on uh, CPUs. We've been gaining uh, share at a rapid clip because we've got you know a, a very strong CPU uh, generation after generation that we've been releasing on, on schedules we've laid out for the industry. But for GPU, it did take us uh, until now to develop really world class hardware and world class software. And what we've done uh, is ensured that because we're a GPU, it, it should be easy to deploy. Uh, and so really making sure uh, that we leverage the fact that we have all the GPU semantics. So if you're, you're a coder, uh, it's, it's just uh, easy to code if, if you're using the, the lower level semantics. Uh, but also uh, we support all of the so key software libraries that are out there. When you think about the kind of frameworks, whether it be PyTorch or a founding member of a PyTorch Foundation, whether it be Onyx, um, whether it be TensorFlow, we are out there very closely working with uh, developers. And so what we've now gotten to now that we have, uh, you know, competitive and leadership offering uh, is what you'll see is that uh, when you're deploying with a AMD, very facile if you're, uh, let's say you're using Hugging Face, any of the, you know, thousands and thousands of LLMs, open source LLMs out there on, on Hugging Face. Well, we partnered with uh, Clem and his team. They, they test as they release any of those language models. Uh, they're testing on AMD with our uh, Instinct GPUs equally as they're testing on NVIDIA. So we've uh, really uh, done the same thing as well with PyTorch, where we're one of two qualified uh, offerings on uh, on uh, PyTorch, and so all of that testing is being done, uh, you know, routinely with the, the regression testing that's run uh, literally every night on any software release. Uh, the other thing that's that's key uh, is to learn from deployments, and so we've had early engagements like Lamini, uh, who's who's running on AMD, and they've been they've been uh, offering, uh, you know. Uh, services of getting on AMD and running your LLMs on their on their cloud, on their uh, their rack uh, configurations they have. Uh, and so they've already been working with customers. And now, as you saw other people on stage with us at our December event, you can see uh, that we're uh, in there with a key uh, hyperscaler uh, and we're also uh, being sold through uh, many uh, OEM applications. And we're directly working with end customers. So there's nothing like that feedback from key customers that are running on your platform uh, to speed us, uh, you know, ensuring that we can just be uh, easily de deployed and, and make sure that, it's, that it, uh, it's a seamless process. Yeah, yeah. Lam and I uh, is a portfolio company for me, and Sharon and Greg are great. I think it's an indication of uh, you guys having a big ecosystem of software developers and machine learning people that want to see 
uh, competition and more heterogeneous compute out there for these AI applications. So you cannot underestimate that. It tells you that it was a very uh, a constrained environment. There was, a, there was a lack of a competition. It was bad for everybody, by the way, if there's a if there's not competition, because you you really end up with a stagnant industry. Uh, you can look at the CPU industry before we brought uh, competitive and leadership. It was really getting stagnant. You're just getting incremental improvements. And so the industry knows that. And we've had tremendous uh, pull and partnership. And we're very appreciative of that. Uh, and and in return, uh, we're going to we're going to keep providing generation after generation of, uh, of competitive product out for such a huge like software stack like Rockham to be open source. Like talk about that philosophy. Oh, it's, uh, it's a great question. It's very near and dear to us because uh, we are, uh, as I mentioned, all about collaboration. That's, uh, you know, just a, such a strong part of our culture. And what open source does is it opens up technology to the community. And so if you look at the, the history of, of AMD, it's been um, very focused on open source. Our, our compiler for our CPUs is LLVM. It's, it's open source. The LLVM is underneath our, uh, our, our compilers on our, on our GPU. But more than just the compiler on the GPU, we've opened up the rock and stack. It is, it is our enabling stack. Uh, it was a huge piece uh, in our uh, winning uh, supercomputing uh, with uh, such large installations we have. Why is it our philosophy? And by the way, uh, Xilinx had exactly the same uh, philosophy. And so bringing Xilinx and AMD together in uh, in 2022 uh, did, did nothing more than um, even deepen that commitment to open source. But Sarah, the, the point is, we're not about locking in someone uh, with a proprietary wall garden software stack. Uh, what we want is uh, we want to win with the best solution. And we want our, we're committed to open source uh, and we're committed to giving our customers choice. Uh, we expect to win having the best solution, uh, but we're, we're not going to lock our customers in. We're going we're gonna to win on merit uh, generation in and generation out. I guess one of the areas that I think is evolving very rapidly right now is sort of the clouds for AI compute. And so there's obviously the hyperscalers, the Azure from Microsoft and AWS from Amazon and GCP from Google, but there's also other players that have been emerging, um, you know, Base 10, Together, Modal, uh, Replicate, et cetera, et cetera. And one could argue that um, they both are providing differentiated services in terms of different tooling, API endpoints, et cetera, that the hyperscalers don't currently have, um, but also that in part they have um, access to GPU and there's a GPU shortage. And so that's also driving part of their utilization. How do you think about that market as it evolves over the next three, four years? And perhaps, you know, GPU becomes a bit more accessible and maybe shortages or constraints fall away. Well, uh, that's definitely happening. I mean, the, the supply constraint uh, will go away. We'll be a part of that. We're uh, ramping up and, and shipping uh, as we speak on our instinct line, uh, and it's going quite well. It's going according to plan. But moreover, uh, to answer your question, I think the way to think about it is that it's just breathtaking how the market is expanding so rapidly. I said earlier that most of the applications today that, that started on the, you know, the generative AI with these LLMs, that, that, that's been largely cloud-based and not just cloud-based, but hyperscaler-based because it's such a massive cluster that's required, not just for the training, but frankly, uh, for a, a, quite a bit of the, the, that type of generative AI LLM inferencing also is on these massive clusters. But what's happening now is we're getting application after application uh, uh, that, that is just taking off non-linearly. Uh, and what we're seeing is a proliferation as people are understanding uh, how they can tailor their models, how they can fine tune it, uh, how they can have smaller models that don't have to answer uh, any question you have or any application you need to support, but it might be just for your business and your area of of exploration. And so that allows a tremendous variety of the size of compute and, and how you need to configure that cluster. So a rapidly expanding market, application-specific configurations you need for your compute cluster, and it moving even further, not just from these massive hyperscalers to, uh, you know, I'll call it, you know, kind of tier two kind of data centers, but it just keeps on going because when you think about uh, applications which are really bespoke and they can be run on the edge, right on your factory floor where, you know, very low latency, put the 
put the uh, inferencing uh, and uh, you know, right at the source of data creation, uh, right to end user devices. So we've added uh, our AI inference accelerators uh, right onto our PCs. We we have been uh, shipping it uh, throughout all of uh, 2023, and actually at CES this year announced already uh, our our next generation of uh, AI accelerated PCs. Uh, and then of course with our Xilinx portfolio across. Uh, embedded devices, we're getting a lot of pull from industry uh, that has bespoke inference application right in a, a plethora of embedded applications. So with that trend, um, uh, we, we're going to see more of that, more tailored uh, compute installations uh, with, with uh, you know, an attempt to service this ballooning demand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I guess a lot or a subset of um, inference is going to push to the edge. And obviously, we'll have things on device, both on laptops as well as phones in terms of, you know, where certain small models will be running. And then it seems like there may be some ongoing potential set of constraints for larger models or larger data centers, at least in the short run. Um, what are the main drivers of the constraints on the GPU supply side? Is that, you know, I've heard things around packaging. I've heard things around TSMC capacity. I've heard sort of a mix of like potential drivers of Constraints. Some people say the next constraint after that is: Do you have enough power into data centers to actually run these? Th I just don't know what's real in terms of all this stuff. And so I'm a little bit curious, like how to think about, you know, what are the constraints and how do we think about when those those um, the supply demand things come a bit more into balance? Yeah, supply demand is uh, frankly something that uh, any chip manufacturer, uh, you know, has to has to manage. You have to secure your supply. You look uh, during the pandemic, uh, we had. Uh, actually, a, a, a tremendous uh, run on our devices uh, that, that uh, stretched our supply chain because the demand for PCs went way up. People were working from home. Uh, the demand for our uh, x86 servers went way up. And so we were in a scramble mode during the pandemic, uh, and we did very well. We worked. Uh, we, we had shortages of substrates, and we, we secured more uh, substrate manufacturing capability. We worked uh, closely uh, with our primary um Wafer Foundry supplier TSMC, uh, we we're, we're, have a, such a deep partnership with them. We've had it for decades uh, that if we get out ahead of it and we understand the signals, uh, we are we are gener generally able to uh, to meet the supply. Or if there's a if there's a shortage, it's uh, generally well contained. Uh, and so what's happening with AI is uh, yes, it is clear that we're seeing this uh, you know this massive uh, increase in the demand. And uh, the fabs are res responding, and you're having to not think of it just as a wafer fab, but you're absolutely right. It is the packaging. Uh, our cells and our GPU competitor both use advanced packaging. I mean, I'll show you. I don't know if the camera will come, come across here, but that is our MI300. And what you see is a whole set of chiplets, uh, so smaller chips with either you know a cpu function an io and memory controller it can be it can be the, the cpu for what the version we have uh, that focuses on high performance compute we literally drop a, uh, our cpu chip it's right in that same integration and all the high bandwidth memory that you have around it uh, to be able to feed those engines and those are connected laterally and on the mi300 we connect them those devices vertically as well so it's a complex supply chain uh, but it's one of which uh, we are very very good at we're a fabulous company we've been fabulous for you know coming on 18 years now uh, and so we've got it down I, uh, hats off to the amd supply chain team uh, I and I think overall as the industry, you'll hear, you'll hear that generally we're going to move beyond those type of supply constraints. Now you mentioned power. This is, I think, uh, ultimately going to be certainly a uh, a key constraint. Uh, and you see, uh, you know, all the major operators looking for sources of power. And for us, as a as a, a developer of the engines which are consuming that power. We brings tremendous focus uh, for energy efficiency and that we can drive into uh, each generation of our design. And, and we are committed to, uh, to that, certainly, at very top priority. One thing you said before, Mark, is that you were actually excited about the innovation of the end of Moore's Law. Um, and that being a reason that you actually wanted to go to AMD, like what directions of innovation should we expect investment in? I don't, I don't know if it's like too deep to ask you to give us a, a layman's understanding of like 3D stacking, but I, I think it is really interesting to to think about it at a at a time when it's not obvious where to go. 
Well, no, sir, it's a, it's a great question. And, and the reason that I was so attracted to, uh, to AMD is, one, it's, it had a storied history of being a, a disruptor in the industry. Uh, and, and I certainly felt very strongly that uh, AMD could disrupt uh, with very strong CPU and GPU, but more importantly, uh, putting the pieces together. Uh, the, the idea of chiplets was just coming together. There was, there was early exploration of that, of, of that around that uh, around that time. And uh, the engineering uh, team here at AMD, we were able to, um, you know, really uh, get the team rallied and the, 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 the key leadership rallied around it and drove that, uh, that, that innovation. So that, the, the reason it's so important is when Moore's Law slows down, you know, the easy way to think about it is it used to be that the chip technology itself, the foundry going from one generation to the next, did most of the heavy lifting. So you could just bank on that new semiconductor te technology node, shrinking your devices, giving you more performance. It have less power and it'd be at the same cost. So that was what Moore's Law was about. And with Moore's Law slowing, it, it means you still get those device improvements, but it costs more. Uh, your power is not coming down as much as it used to. Uh, and uh, you are, are still getting that integration. You're still certainly being able to pack uh, more devices. And, but it, it demands more innovation. It demands what I call holistic design. So you're, you're going you're gonna to rely on those new transistor devices, new foundry nodes. But how you use heterogeneous computing, meaning bringing the right compute engine for the right application, a CPU, a GPU, a, a dedicated engine like we have super low power AI acceleration uh, that we have in our in our PC devices and our embedded uh, devices. So it's about getting uh, you know tailored engines for the for the right application, leveraging chiplets that you combine them, put them on what is the best technology node you want each of those chiplets, each of those functions to be on, and then frankly holistic design means you got to keep going right up. Uh, through the packaging, how you package it together, how you interconnect it, and how you think about the software stack. And so it's literally got a, the, the, the optimization has to be the full circle of transistor design all the way up through the integration of your computing devices and equally with a view of the software stack and applications. Uh, and what I'm uh, thrilled about, uh, along with uh, all the engineers I, that uh, I work with at AMD, is that we we have that opportunity. We have the building blocks, and we are built on collaboration. It's just such a part of our culture uh, that uh, we don't need to develop the entire system. We don't need to be the ones developing the application stack and the end applications. What we do is partner incredibly deeply uh, and ensure that the solution is optimized end to end. I think everybody is very suddenly interested in the chip industry from a strategic perspective as well. I think everybody's thinking more about the supply chain um, from the, you know, TSMC near monopoly to the idea of fab security in an increasingly complex geopolitical environment. How does AMD prep for this or think about these issues? Well, you know, you, you have to think about these things. We are very supportive of working with certainly the U.S. governments and, and uh, other governments uh, across the world, which uh, have exactly that question. How, you know, our, our country is running now on chip design uh, that, that uh, powers such essential systems that uh, it becomes a matter of national security to make sure that there will be continuity of supply. And so we build that into our strategy. Uh, we build it in uh, with our partners. And so we've been supportive of uh, fab expansion. So you see uh, TSMC uh, building fabs in, in Arizona. And we're partnering with them. You see uh, Samsung uh, building fabs in, in Texas. But it's not just in the U.S. They're actually expanding uh, as well, just a, a global uh of facilities in, in Europe and in other parts of Asia. And so uh, it goes beyond the foundry. It's the same thing with the packaging. So where do you, as you put those chips onto carriers and you need to interconnect it, you need that ecosystem uh, to have geographic uh, diversity as well. So the way we think about it is, it, it is a, a matter of importance for everybody to know that uh, that there will be uh, geographic diversity, and we are uh, heavily engaged. And actually, I'm I'm quite pleased with uh, the progress that we're making. It takes it doesn't happen overnight, 
that's the difference between uh, chip design uh, versus software. Someone can up, you know, with software, you can come up with a new idea and get that product out very, very quickly. Get that, uh, you know, MVP design, get it out there, and and it can go viral. Uh, but it does take years of prep uh, in expanding the supply chain. Uh, sem- the whole semiconductor industry was built up as historically as well. This is a global industry and will create geographic pockets of expertise. So that's how we got to where we are today. Uh, but when you have, uh, you know, more volatile, uh, you know, macro that uh, that we're facing today uh, with uh, political tensions, with uh, you know, economic tensions. Uh, it's just imperative uh, that we that we spread out uh, that manufacturing capability, and it's well underway. I guess one of the um, other things that's been happening a lot recently uh, is, and you know, you've been involved with I think some of the most interesting and exciting new consumer hardware platforms like iPhone and iPad and other things. And obviously, um, AMD now is powering many uh, interesting types of devices and applications. Um, what's your point of view on the new hardware things that people are building today? There's the Vision Pro, there's Rabbit, which is sort of an AI first device, there's Humane, focused on the health side, there's Figure. It seems like there's suddenly an explosion of new sort of hardware devices. And I was just curious to get your perspective on what do you think tends to predict success for those types of products? Um, what tends to predict failure? Like how to think about this whole sort of suite of suite of new things and devices that are coming our way? Well, that's a great question. I'll give you... Um... You know, one point, I'll start just with sort of a a technological point of view. I mean, uh, I'm proud of the fact uh, that uh, chip design uh, is part of the reason you're seeing all these different type of applications, because you're getting more and more compute capability that is shrunk down and and draws uh, such a low power that you can can see uh, more and more of these devices that have simply incredible uh, computing and audiovisual capabilities uh, that that they can bring to you. I mean, you look at uh, MetaQuest and Vision uh, Pro and things like that. This isn't happening overnight. It's it. You look at the earlier v- versions; they were simply too heavy, too big, not enough computing uh, umph. Because if the uh, the lag between you know seeing a photon on the that screen and on your head mounted device uh, and actually being a process if that lags too high you actually get physically ill <laughs> wearing uh, you know wearing that and trying to watch a movie or play play a game so one i'm very proud of the the technology advances uh, that uh, we've been able to make as an industry and we were certainly uh, very proud of our uh, aspects that uh, that uh, we drive from AMD uh, but the broader question that you've asked is, well, how do you know what's going to be successful? The technology is an enabler, but uh, if there's one thing I learned at Apple, uh, uh, the devices that are successful really serve a need. I mean, they really give you a capability that you love. <laughs> it's not just that, oh, it's incremental. I can do this a little better than something else I did before. It's got to be something that you love, and that creates a new category. Uh, so... It, it's enabled by technology, but it is the product itself that has to really excite you and give you new capabilities. I will mention one thing. I mentioned the AI enablement in PCs. Uh, that's going to, I think it's almost going to make PCs a new category because when you think of the kind of applications that you're going to be able to run uh, with, with super high performance but yet low power inferencing you can run, uh, imagine right now if I'm, I don't speak English at all, and I'm watching this uh, podcast. Let's say it was a lot, you know, if it's broadcast live, and I click my live translation button, I, I could just have it translated uh, with to my uh, spoken language with all, no perceptible delay. Uh, and that's just one of a myriad of new applications uh, that, that will be enabled. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting time because for many years, like, Increasingly, and AMD benefited from some of this, right? You're also in um, in the data center, but there was so much compute load moving to uh, servers, right? Era of cloud, era of like all these like you know complex consumer social applications. I, I think in like in the new era of trying to create experiences and fighting like all these like new application companies are fighting latency as a, a primary consideration because you have you have the network, the models are slow, you're trying to chain models and you have, you know, things you you want to do on device once again. Um, and I just think that hasn't been like a real design consideration for a while. 
Sir, I, I agree with you. And I think it's it's one of the next set of challenges. Uh, and that is really tackling the idea of not just enabling a high performance and AI applications on the cloud, on the edge, and these end, end user devices, but thinking about how are they working together synergistically, writing applications that where you don't have that latency, that uh, you know, that uh, dependency on on a lag in computing, run it on the cloud. It's going to be the most uh, it's going to be the most efficient because you're optimizing this massive data center uh, with the most efficient computing. But write the algorithm such that where you do have that need for super low latency, you just need that instant response, have those aspects of the algorithms be at the edge or, in fact, uh, on your end-user device. And often, when you need to react quickly, uh, it just has to be the case. I mean, uh, do, do you want to, to be in your vehicle that's being driven uh, at a high degree of uh, autonomous driving, suddenly you get a, a loss of signal back to the cloud and and you just stop, you know, because it says I don't have a signal. You you wouldn't stand for that. So our, our audience is lots of uh, engineers, founders, tech executives, um, consumers, too. What, what do you want people to know about that AMD is focused on in 2024? Well, uh, this uh, for us is a is a huge year because we uh, have spent so many years developing our hardware and software capabilities for AI. We've just completed uh, AI enabling our entire portfolio. So cloud, edge, uh, you know, our PCs, our, our embedded devices, our gaming devices, we're, we're enabling our, our gaming devices to, to upscale using uh, AI. Uh, and 2024 uh, is really a huge deployment year for us. So now, now is the, the bedrock's there, the capabilities there. Uh, I talked to you about uh, all the partners that we're working with. Uh, so 2024 uh, is is for us a huge deployment. I think we're often unknown uh, in in the AI space. So everyone knows our, our competitor, uh, but we not only want to be known in the AI space, but based on the results, based on the capabilities and the value we provide, we want to be known. Uh, it, you know, over the course of 2024, is the company that really enabled and brought AI across those breadth of applications. Yes, in the cloud and those you know, massive uh, LLM uh, training and inference uh, for generative AI, uh, but equally across the entire compute space. And I think this is also the year that that expanded uh, portfolio of applications comes to life. Uh, I look at what uh, Microsoft is talking about in terms of the uh, enablement that they're doing of capabilities, uh, cloud uh, to client. Uh, and uh, it's incredibly exciting. And, and many, many uh, ISVs that I've talked to are doing the same thing. And frankly, Sarah, they're addressing the very question you asked. How do I write my application such that I give you the best experience tapping both the cloud and the device that's in your hand or in, you know, in your, your laptop, uh, you know, as, as, you're, as you're running the application? Uh, so it will be a transport, transformational year. And we're so excited at AMD uh, to be right in the middle of it. Ah, awesome. Looking forward to the year ahead and seeing great things. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you both. This is, uh, like I said, you guys have uh, just done a, a wonderful job here with no priors and uh, very um, uh, happy and uh, appreciative that you invited us on and loved the time with you. It's a real pleasure. Find us on Twitter at no priors Pod. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to see our faces. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. That way you get a new episode every week. And sign up for emails or find transcripts for every episode at no-priors.com.